mutter something about the doors of convict cells being never allowed to be locked within. All dressed and dusty as he is, Jonah throws himself into his berth, and finds the little stateroom ceiling almost resting on his forehead. The air is close, and Jonah gasps. Then, in that contracted hole, sunk, too, beneath the ship's waterline, Jonah feels the heralding presentiment of that stifling hour when the whale shall hold him in the smallest of his bowels wards. Screwed at its axis against the side, a swinging lamp slightly oscillates in Jonah's room, and the ship, heeling over towards the wharf with the weight of the last bales received, the lamp, flamed and all, though in slight motion, still maintains a permanent obliquity with reference to the room, though, in truth, infallibly straight itself. It but made obvious the false, lying levels among which it hung. The lamp alarms and frightens Jonah, as lying in his berth his tormented eyes roll round the place, and this thus far successful fugitive finds no refuge for his restless glance. But that contradiction in the lamp more and more apples him. The floor, the ceiling, and the side, are all awry. Oh, so my conscience hangs in me. He groans straight upwards, so it burns, but the chambers of my soul are all in crookedness. Like one who after a night of drunken revelry hides to his bed, still reeling, but with conscience yet pricking him, as the plungings of the Roman racehorse but so much the more strike his steel tags into him, as one who in that miserable plight still turns and turns in giddy anguish, praying God for annihilation until the fit be passed, and at last amid the whirl of woe he feels, a deep stupor steals over him, as over the man who bleeds to death, for conscience is the wound, and there's naught to staunch it, so, after sore wrestlings in his birth, Jonah's prodigy of ponderous misery drags him drowning down to sleep. And now the time of tide has come, the ship casts off her cables, and from the deserted wharf the uncheered ship for Tarshish, all careening, glides to sea. That ship, my friends, was the first of recorded smugglers. The contraband was Jonah. But the sea revels. He will not bear the wicked burden. A dreadful storm comes on, the ship is like to break. But now when the boatswain calls all hands to lighten her, when boxes, bales, and jars are clattering overboard, when the wind is shrieking, and the men are yelling, and every plank thunders with trampling feet right over Jonah's head, in all this raging tumult, Jonah sleeps his hideous sleep. He sees no black sky and raging sea, feels not the reeling timbers and little hears he or heeds he the far rush of the mighty whale, which even now with open mouth is cleaving the seas after him. Ah, shipmates, Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, a berth in the cabin as I have taken it, and was fast asleep. But the frightened master comes to him, and shrieks in his dead ear, What meanest thou, O oh, sleeper? Arise. Startled from his lethargy by that direful cry, Jonah staggers to his feet, and stumbling to the deck, grasps a shroud, to look out upon the sea. But at that moment he is sprung upon by a panther billow leaping over the bulwarks. Wave after wave thus leaps into the ship, and finding no speedy vent runs roaring fore and aft, till the mariners come nigh to drowning while yet afloat. And ever, as the white moon shows her affrighted face from the steep gullies in the blackness overhead, aghast Jonah sees the rearing bowsprit pointing high upward, but soon beat downward again towards the tormented deep. Terrors upon terrors run shouting through his soul. In all his cringing attitudes, the god fugitive is now too plainly known. The sailors mark him, more and more certain grow their suspicions of him, and at last, fully to test the truth, by referring the whole matter to high heaven, they fall to casting lots, to see for whose cause this great tempest was upon them. The lot is Jonah's. That discovered, then how furiously they mob him with their questions. What is thine occupation? Whence comest thou? Thy country? What people? But mark now, my shipmates, the behavior of poor Jonah. The eager mariners but ask him who he is, and where from, whereas, 
they not only receive an answer to those questions, but likewise another answer to a question not put by them, but the unsolicited answer is forced from Jonah by the hard hand of God that is upon him. I am a Hebrew, he cries, and then, I fear the Lord the God of heaven who hath made the sea and the dry land. Fear him, O Jonah, I, well mightest thou fear the Lord God then. Straightway, he now goes on to make a full confession, whereupon the mariners became more and more appalled, but still are pitiful. For when Jonah, not yet supplicating God for mercy, since he but too well knew the darkness of his deserts, when wretched Jonah cries out to them to take him and cast him forth into the sea, for he knew that for H.I.S. sake this great tempest was upon them, they mercifully turn from him, and seek by other means to save the ship. But all in vain, the indignant gale howls louder, then, with one hand raised invokingly to God, with the other they not unreluctantly lay hold of Jonah. And now behold Jonah taken up as an anchor and dropped into the sea, when instantly an oily calmness floats out from the east, and the sea is still, as Jonah carries down the gale with him, leaving smooth water behind. He goes down in the whirling heart of such a masterless commotion that he scarce heeds the moment when he drops heaving into the yawning jaws awaiting him, and the whale shoots to all his ivory teeth, like so many white bolts upon his prison. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord out of the fish's belly. But observe his prayer, and learn a weighty lesson. For sinful as he is, Jonah does not weep and wail for direct deliverance. He feels that his dreadful punishment is just. He leaves all his deliverance to God, contenting himself with this, that spite of all his pains and pangs, he will still look towards his holy temple. And here, shipmates, is true and faithful repentance, not clamorous for pardon, but grateful for punishment. And how pleasing to God was this conduct in Jonah, is shown in the eventual deliverance of him from the sea and the whale. Shipmates, I do not place Jonah before you to be copied for his sin, but I do place him before you as a model for repentance. Sin not, but if you do, take heed to repent of it like Jonah. While he was speaking these words, the howling of the shrieking, slanting storm without seemed to add new power to the preacher, who, when describing Jonah's sea storm, seemed tossed by a storm himself. His deep chest heaved as with a ground swell, his tossed arms seemed the warring elements at work, and the thunders that rolled away from off his swarthy brow, and the light leaping from his eye made all his simple hearers look on him with a quick fear that was strange to them. There now came a lull in his look, as he silently turned over the leaves of the book once more, and, at last, standing motionless, with closed eyes, for the moment, seemed communing with God and himself. But again he leaned over towards the people, and bowing his head lowly, with an aspect of the deepest yet manliest humility, he spake these words. Shipmates, God has laid but one hand upon you, both his hands press upon me. I have read ye by what murky light may be mine the lesson that Jonah teaches to all sinners, and therefore to ye, and still more to me, for I am a greater sinner than ye. And now how gladly would I come down from this mast head and sit on the hatches there where you sit, and listen as you listen, while some one of you reads M.E. that other and more awful lesson which Jonah teaches to M.E. as a pilot of the living God. How being an anointed pilot prophet, or speaker of true things, and bidden by the Lord to sound those unwelcome truths in the ears of a wicked Nineveh, Jonah, appalled at the hostility he should raise, fled from his mission, and sought to escape his duty in his God by taking ship at Joppa. But God is everywhere. Tarshish he never reached. As we have seen, God came upon him in the whale, and swallowed him down to living gulfs of doom, and with swift slantings tore him along into the midst of the seas, where the eddying death sucked him ten thousand fathoms down, and the weeds were wrapped about his head, and all the watery world of woe bowled over him. Yet even then beyond the reach of any plummet, out of the belly of hell, when the whale grounded upon the ocean's utmost bones, even then, God heard the engulfed, 
repenting prophet when he cried. Then God spake unto the fish, and from the shuddering cold and blackness of the sea, the whale came reaching up towards the warm and pleasant sun, and all the delights of air and earth, and vomited out Jonah upon the dry land, when the word of the Lord came a second time, and Jonah, bruised and beaten, his ears, like two seashells, still multitudinously murmuring of the ocean, Jonah did the Almighty's bidding. And what was that, shipmates? To preach the truth to the face of falsehood. That was it. This, shipmates, this is that other lesson, and woe to that pilot of the living God who slights it. Woe to him whom this world charms from.